Joseph, thank you very much. Very excellent uh, exploration to the future. Uh, you make us uh, more unsure of the next generation sequencing, and we will keep some of questions to the end of the session. Now we are moving to the surgical part of the presentation, and we have the honor and pleasure to have Professor Dr. Maher Gushin from United States of America, and he is an oncosurgeon. He has a very long CV, but he is welcomed as our guest for today, talking about carcinoma in situ. Fact or myth? Thank yes. you very much uh, for the chairpersons for the kind introduction. Thank you for Professor Hisham. You should be congratulated for this meeting over the last decade has gone from a uh, small, medium-sized meeting to really a global presence, uh, certainly in the MENA countries um, of uh, North Africa, Middle East, and uh, the experts not only here, but from uh, Europe and the United States. So moving away a little bit from the previous talks, there's a little bit on ductal carcinoma in situ. I'm going to go over a few population-based studies in the United States that we ran in our group, and then some of the de-escalating, which has become a popular phrase uh, both uh, in the U.S. and around the world, on de-escalating trials for a, a disease that has a very good prognosis, one that's being run in uh, the U.K. and the other in the United States. So surgery, and I'm a surgeon, I make my living by operating, and is there a survival benefit for surgery and ductal carcinoma in situ. So Yasuaki Sagara, who was a postdoctoral fellow of mine, and uh, a few years ago we decided to look uh, at ductal carcinoma in situ, specifically in the United States. We know that there are approximately 60, actually it's about 65,000 cases of DCIS in the United States. And DCIS does uh, present with a broad spectrum of tumor biology, and not all DCIS becomes invasive breast cancer. We know that high-grade DCIS is a uh, risk for local recurrence. And the surgical management has been standard of care, whether it's with breast conservation alone, breast conservation with radiation or mastectomy. However, the effectiveness of actually the surgical procedure we're doing itself has never been uh, formally examined. So what we wanted to look at was a survival benefit on surgical treatment for DCIS based on nuclear grade. There are a lot of uh, difficulties when you use large population databases, and there are a lot of limitations with this, but it also gives us a capture of a fairly large portion of the population. So for this study, we looked at um, SEER, and this is how the coding was done. We use propensity score weighting um, for the probability of breast surgery and the variables of uh, age, year of diagnosis, the tumor size, grade, presence of estrogen, progesterone receptor, uh, and try to balance these factors between those who underwent surgery for ductal carcinoma in situ versus n uh, no surgery itself. So we looked at from between 1988 and 2011, almost 100,000 patients with DCIS, but using our exclusion criteria, we came down with a cohort of 57,000 patients. And this is really the first study where you were actually able to find a large enough group of women um, who had ductal carcinoma in situ on diagnosis by core biopsy, most of these, and actually did not undergo surgery. There was over 1,000 women, um, 1,169 to be exact. And it was interesting to see what were the reasons why surgery did not occur. Over, uh, about half of them, the physician did not recommend surgery, but about the same number of physician recommended surgery, but due to unknown reasons, it was not performed. Uh, these are just some of the baseline characteristics of our patients, but uh, looking at those that did not have surgery, they tended to be more mature in age or older in age. Uh, there was uh, racial differences between the two groups. And then looking at those that did not have surgery uh, based on nuclear grade, whether a uh, high grade was more likely to have a surgical procedure uh, done than those that weren't, and then uh, whether radiotherapy was performed or not. Uh, those that did uh, have DCIS diagnosis, it was likely to have radiation therapy, and then there was actually a small percentage of patients who did not have uh, surgery that did receive radiation instead, which I found a little bit curious. This is uh, about 72 months of follow-up, and the most important thing I think the take-home message for DCIS is that the survival is outstanding, and all of our data that I'll show shows this. The breast cancer-specific mortality is just 1%, and a patient is much more likely to die of some other disease process and not the DCIS itself. 
Uh, this is looking at breast cancer specific survival uh, versus uh, over, uh, and then overall survival versus those that did undergo surgery versus the, those that didn't. And you can see that there was a difference in breast cancer specific survival, but then we decided to break this up. So when we use uh, propensity weighted scoring, if you looked at the low grade disease, there was no difference whether surgery was performed or not in survival. We did show a difference for, with intermediate and high grade, and then the trials that we'll discuss at the end uh, certainly do include the intermediate grade, uh, but those numbers were smaller and the difference uh, was less. And this is just another way of looking at it. Again, for those with low-grade ductal carcinoma in situ that were diagnosed by biopsy and did not undergo definitive surgery, there was no difference whether they did undergo definitive breast surgery or they didn't, but we did show a difference for uh, intermediate and high grade. And then this is just looking at overall survival amongst the group. So we were the first really to look at the survival benefit of DCIS based on nuclear grade. Certainly using any large population data sets, there are a lot of limitations, so we try to correct for those using propensity score. Um, obviously multivariable analysis, but with SEER, the limitations were surgical margins were not, uh, which are obviously important in DCIS and any invasive breast cancer that undergoes surgery. The use of endocrine therapy and then patient comorbidity. We looked at uh, correcting for this, and we'll do this in the last study where we look at NCDB data, which did have those variables. So the survival benefit for low-grade DCIS really didn't exist compared to intermediate and high-grade, and then we recommended prospective clinical trials uh, in terms of non-surgical treatment management for low-grade uh, DCIS, and that's how these trials uh, that are now open in the UK and uh, in the United States, but they also inter uh, include intermediate-grade DCIS. So then we decided to look at radiotherapy and survival benefit. We know that from multiple trials, both in the U.S. and in you know, Europe and around the world, that radiation therapy does reduce the risk of subsequent events, uh, or basically in terms of recurrence uh, for ductal carcinoma in situ. We know that mortality for invasive breast cancer is improved for, uh, uh, with the use of radiation therapy for early stage breast cancer, but for DCIS, uh, that has not been shown. So we know for breast conservation for DCIS that half of these recurrences are invasive and the other half was uh, non-invasive and radiation therapy does reduce the risk of uh, recurrence by over half of patients. But based on these uh, meta-analyses, radiation therapy did not uh, improve overall survival. The number of death, cancer deaths were low, so, and, the, and then the assumption was that, that they were under, the study was underpowered to uh, detect the uh, difference in survival. So Yasuaki and us and our group decided to look at progn the patient prognostic score, which is developed by uh, Smith and Bruce Hafty in association with survival benefit for radiotherapy for ductal carcinoma in situ. We published this in JCO. We wanted to hypothesize, was, is there a survival benefit for a, a subset of population for patients with ductal carcinoma in situ? Again, we went back to SEER. There are obviously a, this, those same limitations that, uh, that always exist. Uh, we looked at a cohort between 1988 and 2007, so slightly different than our previous study, 76,000 patients, but when you got down to our final cohort with our exclusion criteria, it was 32,000 patients. I think the importance here is that, again, patients almost never die of DCIS. If you look at overall breast cancer-specific mortality, it shows exactly the same as we did in our previous study of 1%. There was, uh, obviously, you can see the numerical differences between the no, no radiation therapy and radiation therapy, but more importantly, that the patient, if they were going to die, was going to die of something else not related uh, to their ductal carcinoma in situ. So the cumulative risk of breast cancer-specific mortality uh, whether with using propensity score, there was a difference between radiotherapy versus not, 2.1 versus 1.8 percent. This was statistically different. But then with using SEER, what we were able to do is look at patient age, the tumor size and grade and what effect this had on it. And again, this is using um, the patient prognostic score, which was developed by a group of, from Bruce Hafty and uh, Smith, and it was published in 2006, looking at giving points based on age, size, and histology. And again, SEER does not have margin information, which was a, a very valid criticism of this study. So if you had a low patient propensity score, uh, meaning that these were patients that were more mature or older in age, smaller size of DCIS, um, they were unlikely to benefit from radiotherapy, but if they had those uh, negative uh, features in terms of young age, 
uh, larger size of DCIS that radiotherapy ended up being of benefit. So we've looked to valid, we validated the prognostic score for DCIS, which can be used to predict not only local recurrence, but also the magnitude of survival benefit for radiotherapy for breast conservation. Finally, we wanted to look at, in the United States, what, is, what are actually we doing as healthcare providers and, and what are our patients choosing? And in this, we went from SEER to the National Cancer Database, which sits in the American College of Surgeons. Um, and the Commission uh, uh, on Cancer, and we looked at 2004 and 2013, uh, whether uh, radi uh, looking at radiotherapy and endocrine therapy use for breast conservation for DCIS, and this really gets to those de-escalation trials that I'll get to again at the end. This time we went to, again, a different database. There are, again, always limitations, but these are large enough numbers for us to give us uh, a very important information on actually what we're doing and what trends are. Uh, we wanted to look at the use of, of radiotherapy in the United States and or endocrine therapy, um, and these were some of the factors we looked at. Uh, the, when you look at uh, the COC data from the NCDB, it's a much, it captures a much larger portion of the population of the United States than SEER, so we had 183,000, but again, when you look at exclusion criteria, and these are things that were obviously important for ductal carcinoma in situ, such as nuclear grade, tumor size, and margin status. Uh, and uh, being available, and then looking at our other exclusion criteria, we came with down with an analytical cohort of 66,000 patients. So the median age was 60. Uh, not surprisingly, these patients tended to be fairly healthy. And then the number of cases um, for breast conservation for DCIS over the last uh, over that last decade period of time increased. Most DCIS was small, most was estrogen positive, um, and, uh, and then me intermediate to high grade was much more common than low grade. Uh, and importantly, what NCDB does capture is margin status. It doesn't give us margin width, which I know for the surgeons are very important, but positive versus negative, and most of these patients had negative final surgical margins. And again, what I, we found interesting was what was actually happening for both estrogen or hormone receptor positive DCIS versus hormone receptor negative. So if you look at the hormone receptor positive uh, cohort of 50,000 patients, you can see that the use of endocrine therapy alone, uh, at least visually or numerically, looked like it was increasing over the period of time and combination therapy as well, but radiotherapy alone uh, was uh, decreasing. And then surprisingly, a little bit for us, in the hormone receptor negative, you can actually see tiny slivers of light blue so that there are some hormone receptor negative DCIS that underwent breast conservation that was receiving endocrine therapy, much more likely to receive uh, radiation therapy alone. And there were also some that were receiving both uh, endocrine therapy and radiotherapy. So looking at adjuvant therapy over the period of time, you can look at what happened for the use of radiation therapy um, during this time period between two, when you looked at compared to 2013 versus 2004, the use of endocrine <coughs> therapy uh, alone uh, and combination therapy alone increasing in the hormone receptor positive uh, ductal carcinoma in situ. And when we looked at the effects of age, less likely to receive radiotherapy as they became more mature in age, uh, combination therapy, and again, as expected, uh, uh, endocrine therapy alone or uh, combination therapy, uh, uh, combination therapy decreased as the patient became older in age. Uh, when we broke it down by tumor size and grade, um, again, for this is for hormone receptor positive DCIS that uh, the use of radiotherapy ended up increasing if you had larger areas of DCIS or higher grade, which made sense. Uh, use of endocrine therapy alone or combination therapy, you can see what the differences were. So patients with DCIS greater than 15 millimeters or one and a half centimeters were much more likely to receive radiotherapy. But the use of endocrine therapy was not uh, influenced by the tumor DCIS size. The patients with high-grade DCIS were my, uh, more likely to receive both radiotherapy and or endocrine therapy during this uh, study period. Positive, and this is what ended up being very interesting for us, was that positive margins for breast conservation were actually associated with lower use of radiotherapy and endocrine therapy, that patients with higher comorbidities were less likely to receive radiotherapy. That wasn't as interesting. It was not as surprising. And the use of endocrine therapy alone was not influenced by increased in comorbidity during the study period. 
When we looked at some of the other important uh, factors in the United States, uninsured patients were less likely to receive radiotherapy, and then patients insured by Medicare were uh, less likely to receive both radiotherapy and or endocrine therapy. Uh, and again, this was for the cohort for estrogen receptor positive DCIS undergoing breast conservation. And when we looked at the um, whether, where the therapy was given, whether it was given in the community where much, most of breast cancer care in the United States is versus academic and research institutions, uh, patients treated at academic and research institutions um, and patients treated at community centers were more likely to receive both radiotherapy and endocrine therapy. And we also saw a large variation in terms of both uh, receipt of radiotherapy, endocrine therapy based on geographic location. Getting to where, again, these de-escalation trials are going to become important, and this is, I think, important to support that we are going to be able to accrue to these trials. We define a low-risk cohort of DCIS, and the way we described low risk was uh, patients over the age of 60, less than uh, 16 millimeters of DCIS, low grade and negative margins. And you can see that between from 2004 trending to 2013, that the use of endocrine therapy looked like it inc had increased, um, but the use of, um, you can see that the use of both radiotherapy and endocrine therapy and radiation therapy uh, alone decreased during that time period, again, suggesting that we would likely be able to add patients or put patients on these trials. So the strengths and limitations, uh, we were looked at comprehensive evaluation of adjuvant therapy for breast conservation and ductal carcinoma in situ using large databases. Certainly, NCDB, just like SEER, has limitations. Um, there are issues whether we know whether the patient actually completed those therapies that were uh, recommended or started, uh, and there is uh, insufficient data on local recurrence uh, or recurrence data in NCDB. But our study suggests that the following shifts of care in hormone receptor positive DCIS in the United States was decreased use of radiotherapy and, in, and increased use of endocrine therapy and combination therapies. Again, hopefully suggesting um, that we can uh, put patients on the COMET trial in the U.S. and then potentially supporting LORIS trial in the U.K. Uh, the magnitude of benefit for surgery and radiation therapy are layered and complex. There are groups that are low risk enough to consider emitting local therapy uh, and then supporting the trials. So the two trials that are, uh, have accrued probably the most and open are LORIS, which was started by Adelaide Francis, who unfortunately passed away from pancreatic cancer in the past year. Uh, looking at, in the UK, at low or intermediate grade DCIS that was diagnosed on uh, core biopsy with central pathology review, randomizing to surgery versus active surveillance, and in the UK, uh, and, and they're looking at ipsilateral invasive disease at five years, and in the UK, active surveillance is yearly mammogram versus the surgery arm and going down the standard route of breast conservation <coughs> or mastectomy or breast conservation with uh, uh, radiotherapy, and then the active surveillance, there's a central imaging, and not only central pathology, but central imaging review, uh, and again, it's a randomized trial looking, uh, at, looking at both quality of life factors, but also the development of invasive uh, breast cancer. In the U.S., the COMET trial, the comparative effectiveness of uh, operative versus medical and endocrine therapy for low-risk DCIS, which was a PCORI grant that Shelley Wong has gotten, Ann Partridge from our uh, institution, and Alice R. Thompson. Uh, and Liz Frank, who's the patient advocate lead. So a little bit different. Um, they're looking at uh, registering and randomizing 1,200 patients, and then there's group one and two. In the United States, either the group one that's randomized to uh, surgery plus or minus radiation therapy, those are, that's for those that are undergoing breast conservation and endocrine therapy, versus group two where there's a very strong suggestion for the use of endocrine therapy and then doing every six month mammogram. This is different than the yearly mammogram. This looks at uh, eligibility criteria. We want low or intermediate grade DCIS. Those are estrogen receptor positive. Not all institutions do this and we just stopped two weeks ago looking at HER2 it's for, and if you do do HER2 testing, it should be HER2 negative for DCIS. Um, one we're looking at uh, in terms of uh, invasive breast cancer diagnosis at two, five, and seven years, uh, and then uh, conversion to those uh, that undergo mastectomy and radiation therapy, and then looking at overall breast cancer survival and breast cancer specific survival. I think very important in this is the quality of life and psychosocial outcomes and then the surgical decision making that's been built into this.
So concluding with one minute and the beepings I know are about to start, the NCI definition for cancer is that it's cancer is the name given to a collection of related diseases. In all types of cancer, some of the body cells begin to divide without stopping and spread into surrounding tissue. Cancerous tumors are malignant, which means that they can spread into or invade nearby tissue. In addition, these tumors grow, um, grow, grow. some cancer cells break off to distant parts of the body. DCIS is not cancer. In some cases, it may become or convert to breast cancer over time in the U.S. specifically, but also around the world. I think we are over-treating ductal carcinoma in situ. I think Loris, Comet, and other trials will help refine the role of surgical decision making. And this is actually pretty hard for surgeons to say we're actually going to operate less. This is what we do for a living. But in some, and actually probably more than some cases, I think that's important. Little bit different weather in uh, Boston, if you come and visit. That's my son digging my car, believe it or not, out from uh, a snowstorm. Uh, and um, I'm very happy to be back here in uh, Cairo. Thank you very much for the privilege of the podium. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Mehra. Now it's time to uh, present uh, an eminent professor of medical oncology at UCSF, Professor Hope Rugo, all the way from San Francisco. Glad you could make it. We're honored to have you with us. Uh, she'll be talking to us about hormonal treatment algorithm in metastatic uh, hormone responsive breast cancer patient selection updates and future. Dr. Rugo, please. Thank you so much, and thanks for asking me to participate in this uh, great and growing meeting for a second year. It's exciting to be here uh, and uh, hear these great presentations, and I look forward to the panels as well. It doesn't snow in San Francisco, but it is farther away. So uh, we have a lot of our own natural disasters, as you've heard, fire, mudslides, you name it. Uh, okay, so my talk today is about, uh, I was asked to talk about a hormonal treatment algorithm for metastatic hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer. Uh, so I'll try and go through some of that as a summary and uh, then talk about uh, a potential algorithm. So one of the interesting publications in the last year actually came from PAN, uh, from the Early Breast Cancer Trialist Group in the New England Journal of Medicine. And I think we were all surprised to see this data when it was presented uh, at San Antonio. 91 trials and 46,000 women who had received five years of endocrine therapy, largely tamoxifen. And they looked at the cumulative risk of distant recurrence from year five to 20. Surprisingly, in patients who had T1 node negative disease, the distant recurrence rate was 14% and went up to almost 50% in patients who had tumors greater than two centimeters and four to nine positive nodes. Other risk factors that impacted the rate of distant recurrence included tumor grade and KI-67. This, uh, of course, paper resounds with all of us in clinic, and just over the last few weeks, potentially, I don't know, there's always seems to be more relapses at the end and beginning of the year. Uh, for us, the, it, you know, I've had five patients have relapses after the year 10 uh, who had hormone receptor positive disease and now receive 10 years of adjuvant endocrine therapy. So this is an ongoing problem, and our clinics will continue to be treating patients who have metastatic disease. So this is particularly important to us. In fact, hormone receptor positive disease is the most common subtype that we see both in early and late stage. And I think as we move forward, we're going to have to stratify our treatments for these patients based on biologic characteristics that go past ER. Our ongoing uh, challenge in these patients is to try and prolong response duration to endocrine therapy, but also be sure that we're maintaining quality of life or improving quality of life. So we don't want to be giving patients uh, treatment that has the same or more toxicity as chemotherapy. On the other hand, it does seem to be important to treat patients with oral or injectable therapy that has less toxicity than chemotherapy for as long as possible. Our optimal use of endocrine therapy following international guidelines is sequential endocrine therapy uh, with or without targeted agents, except in patients who have immediately life-threatening disease. So this is not true of patients who have, for example, limited visceral disease or even extensive visceral disease and who are asymptomatic. These patients may respond to endocrine therapy. One of the questions, of course, that has been addressed over the last year or so is whether or not there's a preferred endocrine therapy for initial treatment or not. And although I think we have an answer for that when we use single endocrine therapy in patients who have endocrine-naive disease, we don't know the answer to that overall. 
in the attempt to try and prolong response duration uh, and, in the long run, reduce distant recurrence. We've targeted single transduction pathways that are known to play an important role in the development of or upfront resistance to endocrine therapy. And this includes antagonizing the most common altered pathway in endocrine uh, responsive disease, the PI3 kinase mTOR pathway, and now blocking cyclin-dependent kinases. We know, all know data from Bolero 2 with the addition of everolimus uh, to exemestane in patients who had progressed on prior non-steroidal aromatase inhibitor therapy. And this trial remains important to us because everolimus continues to be an option uh, for treatment for women worldwide, uh, but also because this was the first targeted agent in HER2 negative hormone receptor positive disease to show a substantial difference in progression free survival compared to endocrine therapy alone, albeit in pretreated patients. We've actually seen similar results now in combination with other endocrine therapy and in different lines of treatment, uh, which I think further substantiates the improved outcome seen with Everolimus in terms of progression free survival. In combination with tamoxifen in an initial unblinded phase two trial, in combination with fulvestrant in the more recent precog trial, and then even more recently in Bolero 4 in a non randomized trial in the first line setting in combination with letrozole. One of the big issues, of course, when we treat patients with metastatic hormone receptor positive disease is trying to maintain or improve quality of life, and we can't do that if we're causing substantial toxicity. When we looked at toxicity from Everolimus, the most common side effect was actually stomatitis. And because this stomatitis mimics aphthous ulcers, we were interested in studying whether or not using steroids topically could reduce the incidence or improve recovery in patients who had stomatitis. We first needed to understand the timeline of stomatitis, and interestingly, like many toxicities that we see actually from targeted agents, the toxicity was early, uh, so that almost all toxicity, 90%, occurred in the first eight weeks. And this is agent-specific rather than disease-specific. It's seen across different diseases. We actually use the steroid mouthwash, as people here know, in a trial we call the SWISH trial, uh, a steroid mouthwash which is easily obtainable because it's simply liquid dexamethasone. And what we found was a marked reduction in the incidence of grade two stomatitis in the first eight weeks from 20% to 2.4%, uh, and a reduction even, although modest in grade one, toxicity from 34% to 19%, and a complete elimination of grade three stomatitis. Uh, you can see the number of patients who were blue who had no stomatitis were markedly increased. And although this was a phase two ran non-randomized trial, somewhat surprisingly, uh, the use of the steroid mouthwash was added to the label by the US FDA on the strength of this data. Now, we've also seen uh, interesting data antagonizing the PI3 kinase mTOR pathway from the other end, antagonizing PI3 kinase. And you would ask, why wasn't this the initial approach? Why was mTOR the initial target? And that's actually just a practical answer, because we had mTOR inhibitors that were approved, so we could test them. Uh, and actually, the first study using temsorolimus, uh, either the uh, mTOR inhibitor is less effective uh, or the schedule was less impactful because they didn't see stomatitis. And in that trial, in the first line setting, we didn't see an improvement in progression free survival. If you could target PI3 kinase, it would be great because then you're targeting the initiation of the pathway and maybe you'd have better efficacy. But the initial steps in looking at PI3 kinase inhibitors resulted in too high toxicity. Then we had our current agents, pan-PI3 kinase inhibitors, and more uh, alpha-specific uh, or beta-sparing agents. So the first trials looked at